Hi, everyone. On behalf of the Wheeler Centre, I want to welcome you all to Quarantine Cravings, the final event in Wheeler Centre's 2020 Broadly Speaking series, which is proudly supported by Christina Campbell Pretty, AM and family. My name is Brody Lancaster and I'll be moderating our chat today. Uh, but before we kick off, I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that today's conversation is taking place across unceded sovereign land the world over. This event stream comes to you from the Wheeler Centre, which is located on the lands of the Kulin Nation, which is where Julia and I both live and work. And on behalf of our panel and the Wheeler Centre, I'd like to pay respect to Bunurong and Woiwurrung elders and ancestors, and to those of the Kulin Nations and all communities and cultures that this conversation reaches, wherever you're watching from tonight. As I mentioned, our panelists are located all over the world today, and it's kind of a miracle that we found a time that could work for all four of us. Um, <laughs> and with that in mind, I'll uh, introduce you to our panelists and uh, to what's on their plates today. Um, we're going to start with breakfast and Julia Busatul Nishimura. Julia is a Melbourne-based cook, author, and teacher. Her second book, A Year of Simple Family Food, was recently was recently released and is proving to be a wonderful follow-up to 2017's Ostro, which I think just about everyone I know in Melbourne has on their bookshelf. Um, <laughs> morning, Julia. What are you Good and morning, your family buddy. having for breakfast today? Breakfast, um, it was rather quick because it's quite early. So um, we had toast <laughs> with um, actually like uh, this like almond chocolate spread, which is so good. Um, and it's made by like these local chocolate guys and it's, you know, like fancy Nutella really. So <laughs> we had that and um, like, uh, yeah, a black coffee. <laughs> Delish. I was reading your book and you've got the spread with like a classic Japanese breakfast and I just have this image that that's what's that's what you're making every single day. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not every day. That is definitely a weekend thing like and that is more nori like he is uh he actually makes breakfast every morning so he's more of the breakfast person. But um yeah, we love I love Japanese breakfast. We have that more on the weekends. Um, but yeah, usually it's like toast. I am a big fan of like the dippy eggs. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's usually yeah. what I have every morning. <laughs> um, yeah, pancakes on the weekend and things like that. Breakfast Great. is nice. So we're going to move over to lunch. Not quite lunchtime. We're a little late. But um, Hawa Hassan is joining us from New York. Um, Hawa is the founder and CEO of Best Best Source, a line of condiments inspired by Somalia, where Hawa is from. Her incredible first book is In Bibi's Kitchen, The Recipes and Stories of Grandmothers from the Eight African Countries That Touch the Indian Ocean. Power, it's very food-focused week in New York. I feel like everywhere, no matter where you are, if you're not in America, you're thinking about <laughs> turkeys and potato this week, just to break the fourth, fourth wall for everyone yeah. we're recording this just before Thanksgiving. Um, what is on your plate today? So I'm super basic. I'm the opposite of Julia in that my breakfasts are really simple. Um, usually a black coffee with a dash of oatmeal milk um, or oat milk. And today I ended up having that, went to lunch. I had a meeting for lunch and I had a Saigon sandwich, which is a Vietnamese sandwich. I crave this sandwich. I travel for it. It's in my neighborhood at a restaurant called Walter's. They have a beautiful outdoor uh, seating that I adore. And so it's like shredded carrots and cabbage and a jalapeno. And they've got a beautiful sauce on there. And then obviously that baguette that we all love so much. So that's what I had half of it. And then I brought the other half home for dinner. <laughs> the best. I always try to make a stop yeah. for like a bun me if I'm running errands to like grab one of those oh. like Vietnamese sandwiches. And by the time you yeah. get home, all the juice is soaked into the bread. Exactly. It's it's so interesting. I've lived in this neighborhood for 15 years. I maybe used to go to Walter's like once a month for dinner. I never got the Saigon sandwich. And for, for one reason or another during COVID, it's become my, my comfort food. Mm. Um, well, we're all looking for comfort in the form of eating <laughs> this year, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Um, and finally, Easter Belfridge, who's uh, is joining us from London. Easter's formal 
culinary career began at Ottolenghi's Nopi restaurant and most recently saw her become the co-author of Ottolenghi Flavor, her first book. She's a contributor to publications including The Guardian and The New York Times and makes regular guest chef appearances in some of the best restaurants in London. Um, Hi, Easter. Hey, so nice to to meet you all here. You too. Um, Um, It's dinner time, kind of, over there. What are you uh, cooking or eating tonight? Uh, So I've actually just come from the test kitchen where I work, um, Ottolenghi's test kitchen, and we had a little, uh, because we're still allowed to go to work and uh, uh, be with our colleagues, even though we're kind of in lockdown. Um, But it was uh, two of my colleagues' birthday, so we got um, a Sri Lankan takeout, um, a place called Hoppers, and it was really good. We had some mutton curry rolls and uh, fish curry and lots of delicious sambals and... That was my first dinner. I'm definitely plan- I'm going to eat again after. It'll probably be like tin fish, which is one of the best things, and fried eggs. <laughs> I wonder if they see the order come through and it's like deliver to Ottolenghi Test Kitchen and they put like, no, you know, extra love I mean, into that order. It just has a very order. boring address. It just has a very boring address. It says, I think, Unit 21 or something like that. So <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> Okay. Anonymous. Um, in preparing, we kind of mentioned it before, the comfort food of this year, but in preparing for um, our chat today, I was thinking back to the very start of the pandemic, kind of March, April, um, when we were all preparing for what the next few months were going to be. Um, and the conversations by and large were about food. It was about food insecurity, mutual aid, or it was about stockpiling and the shelves of supermarkets being completely cleared out, um, making sourdough or making like a trendy thing that everyone was doing on TikTok. Um, I'd love to hear how the start of this year looked for you food-wise and how you kind of planned for what was going to happen in your life and, in effect, in your kitchen. Maybe we'll start with... Uh, Julia yeah sure I mean I had a baby in January so when we kind of um yeah started when there was conversations about like potential lockdown you know I had like an eight week old baby so it was like a 12 week old yeah so it was kind of a very strange time anyway you know I was in this very like new postnatal stage again and I guess I wasn't so worried about you know, stockpiling or anything like that, because I think as like a Maltese person, like my cupboard is just always stockpiled. (laughs) I didn't really have to do any kind of, um, you know, big buying, but I did, you know, I think the panic that started kind of circling around made me panic a little bit. And I kind of, you know, it was hard to like not feed into that idea that you wouldn't be able to buy certain things. And I think especially as a, someone who loves cooking, you know, I was like, oh, I don't want to be without like, pancetta and like I'm gonna (laughs) buy like a big piece of guanciale and things like that I was like what are the things that I can make uh you know buy a few things was there a run on pancetta early in the (laughs) (laughs) at my local deli there definitely was (laughs) okay um yeah like pasta and things like that I mean I remember just buying things that I knew I could make like so many different meals out of so I like bought guanciale like a big really big piece because I knew I could make like several different pasta dishes um mm. uh what else did we buy like we st- I mean we or like my hu- my husband's a chef and so we have like 12 liters of soy sauce and like 10 mm. kilo bags of rice anyway <laughs> you know we kind of have a stockpiled kitchen but for me it was making sure yeah I could get those things that I love to cook for comfort so it was pasta like you know I really went back to when I lived in Italy and how we would have pasta every day and I was like if we're going to be at home every day I need to like punctuate the day with you know a hot pasta meal so I was just making sure I had enough kind of things which you know like Easter said like tinned fish um yeah cured meats things that would last a long time that I wouldn't feel guilty Mm -hmm. about stockpiling (laughs) um Hala what about you um oh sorry I caught you well I'm I'm no it's okay I was like sipping tea you know that's what they say in America (laughs) sipping tea um 
I, I have to be honest, I was not doing a lot of cooking at the beginning of the pandemic. I actually wrote this whole post on Instagram right before we went into lockdown, um, saying that in these times of panic, like tap into the different places in the world where women have had to leave with their babies clinched to their hip in the middle of the night, where people have had to put their children on a boat and never see them again, like draw from that energy. And I think I like ended it and I said, um, uh, courage favors the brave or uh, something like, or some, something like about courage. Like I, I'll find the quote and send it to you all, but or fortune favors the brave. And my whole point in saying that was like, you know, I'd lived in this country since 1993 and it was this place of a safe haven for me in so many different ways. And then here comes this time in March. And it wasn't like Americans didn't know what was going on with the rest of the world, right? Because like we're people, we have our, we have an arm's length away from most issues. But within like two weeks, it hit us and panic set in. Like if you were at a dinner, people were like crying. They were sad. They were, they were saying how everyone was going to that. I had never seen anything like it living here because again, for me, I associate America with like a safe haven, a place where I ran from war to. And so um, I did what I always do, which is when I see things like this happening, as my mother has done, is I locked into my community. So the very first week of COVID, we started feeding hospitals. Um, and by like week four, I think we were feeding five or six hospitals. And until today, we are still in partnership and we feed a nonprofit now. So we feed 600 families. And I, I was just saying at my last meeting, I said, I don't know what happened in the midst of COVID and like the start of it, but I really have fallen out of love with cooking. Um, there was a time in my life where I was like punctuating my day with like pasta. I was like, I miss home. I'm going to make this red sauce that reminds me of my mom. But in COVID, I stopped cooking for myself. Uh, and I really just started cooking for the people in my neighborhood. And I've been doing that the whole time. So we've been making a lot of stews. Uh, we made a lot of proteins. We did lots of like basic chicken. I partnered with my neighbors, Colona Verde, which is a Latin uh, Latin X restaurant in Fort Greene, and that's what we've been doing the whole time. So I've been feeding other people. I haven't really been eating great myself, but I've been drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> Is that priority for other people? Do you think just a just a kind of surveying the scene and going, who needs this care the most? Is it a priority in America? It would be really nice if it was. Um, I mean, for you. I mean, for you no. personally. <laughs> just oh, the yeah. idea that you're no, not I, you're I not mean, cooking for yourself in the way that you are for others. Yeah, it is a priority for me. You know, when this started to happen, I started, I immediately started to think about what the single mothers in my neighborhood needed, what, you know, we have our residents, homeless people who live like, or, you know, who live on our street. I was like, what are they going to do? They're, you know, now that we're all going to be like afraid to talk to each other. And so the coffee shop in uh, in our building got involved with us. They started delivering coffee to people who were outside. We started giving food to anyone who needed it. And for me, honestly, it was my saving grace in this whole thing because my family lives in Europe. And so it wasn't like I was going to go home. Um, and just being around my community and being here in Brooklyn really helped me get through, you know, um, but also being of service to other people enabled me to just show up in a way that I probably wasn't doing on, on a daily basis here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really highlighted the need across the board for, and, and where the gaps were that we could kind of look to fill. Oh, um, absolutely. Easter, what about you? What did the kind of the start of, you mentioned before London's kind of like going in and out of these different stages of lockdown at the moment, which Julia and I can mm. relate to having been in Melbourne this winter. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back to like March, April, what was that like for you cooking wise? Um, well, it's really hard to follow Hawa's amazing uh, description, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, what you've been doing sounds incredible. Um, I I was still working from, so we, we closed the test kitchen and we were all 
developing recipes from home. So in terms of the day to day, it was it was pretty similar. Um, I, I did go a little bit stir crazy. I was in the middle of moving houses and I was I, I went to stay with my mum for a couple of weeks and then lockdown happened and I couldn't move into my new house. So I ended up locking down with my mother. And uh, I mean, I love her, but that was it was it was pretty tough. <laughs> but uh, but I kept myself busy by yeah continuing to to develop recipes, which we need. You know, we publish three recipes in the Guardian every Saturday, so that's like it's constant work. And I guess I kept myself busy also by the, the weather was amazing during the first lockdown. So I built a little outdoor. I mean, I say a little outdoor kitchen. It was really just like a shelving unit with a camping stove on it, but uh. It, it it took me like three days and then I was just cooking outside and um, I think it was, it was kind of a fun process for developing, uh, well, shutting off my mind from everything that was happening around and um, shopping wasn't too easy to do and getting to the shops wasn't too easy. So we were developing recipes with sort of few ingredients and just opening the cupboard and seeing what had been sitting there for months or years or, or gathering dust and then coming up with recipes from that. And that was kind of what punctuated the recipes that were coming out during during those months but um mm. yeah that that's that's pretty much what I what I did mm. <laughs> in those recipes that were published um did you did you guys kind of think do people need something different from food at the moment are they looking for you know everyone bought a big bag of beans should we tell them something to do with beans or <laughs> you know with as a recipe developer, were your priorities a little different? Yeah, for sure. I think we were definitely more frugal in our ingredients and what we expected people to go out and get, I guess. Um, I mean, people always, uh, some people love it and some people hate it, but some, a lot of people always complain that Otilengi recipes have a crazy amount of ingredients that you need to go to five different shops to get. And I always kind of get annoyed by that because I kind of say like, well, if you, if you, if you don't want to learn about new ingredients or, or, or learn something new, then go to another recipe. But um, but yes, yeah, for sure, we were definitely shortening the ingredient list and making sure that it was things that people that was easy that were easily accessible for for people, and and definitely doing lots of one pot stews. And um, my my colleague Noor, who's from Bahrain, made this incredible tandoori chickpea dish where she just put chickpeas, oil, ginger, loads of spices. Um, in a kind of like a what do you call them a dutch oven or something like that and then put yeah. it in the oven and cooked for hours and it made the most incredible sort of wonderful tantori chickpea dish uh which kind of took the internet by storm um and i um i actually uh, i was uh experimenting with making yang yang noodles because it was one of the dishes that i missed the most from my my favorite um restaurant shan impression in north london so um, I practiced that and I did a little video and people kind of took to to stretching their own noodles at home. So that was quite fun. Um, oh, very I'm worrying. really glad you mentioned because... the noodles because I know many people who made Easter's bang bang noodles. <laughs> well, I feel mm. I feel very awkward about that because I, I mean, I was very upfront from the beginning saying this dish is basically my two favorite dishes from Sean Impression mixed together, which is the, the Biang Biang noodles and this cucumber salad that comes in this like really punchy sesame sauce. So, I, and I always mix them together when I go to that restaurant. So that was what the recipe was about. And it really sort of freaked me out that some people actually thought that I had invented Biang Biang noodles. So that was really <laughs> distressing and obviously got the message out very soon. Like, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, I think I was very clear from the beginning that these... <laughs> yeah, but it was it was really fun to see people from all over the world making it, and I, yeah, actually, I think it took off most in Australia. I saw so many people making them there. Someone even did it in the nude, which was pretty fun. <laughs> oh, I didn't know why I said in the nude, naked. <laughs> <laughs> nude noodles. Yeah, I wish I sounds very British. Nude noodles. Yeah, I mean, I was noodles. into it. it was great. She had some <laughs> great music playing and. It was brilliant. That's awesome. Wow. It, it, sounded really, ask... it sounded really classy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In the nude. <laughs> Bagging the noodles. <laughs> yeah, lots of slapping going on. It's really like a, <laughs> yeah, a situation. Lots of for... people 
<laughs> lots of people leaning into the slapping sound and you know making of that what they will and like yeah that was pretty funny <laughs> yeah if you think too much about the oil and the slapping and the yeah it, it's a it's a feast um the mind wanders <laughs> Have you, I mean, that kind of brings me to something I have been very curious about for years, I guess, for chefs as um, and recipe developers as the internet, specifically Instagram, becomes um, a place for food sharing. You know, it's the cliche. People say, like, I'm not going to go on Twitter. I don't want to hear about what someone's had for breakfast. But it's like, show me a photo of what you've had for breakfast and that's another story. I want to look at that. Um <laughs> And I imagine, you know, people writing recipes in decades past would would not have had the same kind of call and response almost from their audience or the people making it as as you tend to get these days using Instagram. And I'm curious to know um, specifically this year when when people who maybe weren't home cooks had to be um, or people just decided to try something new or try new cookbooks or follow new food personalities on Instagram. What, what was your kind of your perception of what other people were doing with your recipes during this year? I'll oh, start to- with, oh. Oh. <laughs> yes, for all of you, but maybe we'll start with you, Easter. Sorry, I'm not doing a good job of like assigning my, oh. my questions. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's always completely surreal to, to see people cooking your recipes. Um, and I guess I I didn't really have as much of that until until Flavor came out in when did it come out September, um, so that was that was really surreal and yeah to see people from all over the world making the dishes it's just the most wonderful feeling. But I mean and equally I get so much inspiration. I I hate to say it because I really wish I spent less time on my phone and I wish I didn't have to use Instagram, but we all do for our careers. But I get so much in, uh, inspiration from Instagram and seeing uh, the kind of work that people make. And I think it's, although there are a lot of bad things to be said about everyone using phones and being addicted, uh, it is wonderful to see like this new wave of creativity that's come out of people being able to share ideas. And yeah, I mean, I just open my phone and I'm like immediately inspired to create other recipes. Um, so yeah, it's a great thing. Julia, what about you? I feel like not a not a moment goes by that you would not be seeing the the fruits of someone using your recipes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of like Issa said, like I feel it's such a huge privilege. I mean, to be able to write a, a cookbook or cookbooks in general because I think people, you know, I just don't take it very lightly, people buying the book and buying ingredients and spending mm-hmm. time in their kitchen. I think it's such a huge privilege for people for to be able to trust you to cook, you know, your recipes. And so when I see people making them, I, yeah, it's such a thrill because for me, food is so um, personal and it's such a, um, you know, part of my life. And when I see people especially when I see them like adapting recipes and kind of making it their Mm. own. I really love that because I think, you know, there's one thing to like cook from a set of ingredients, but to kind of take your own experience and what's in your cupboard. And, you know, especially during the pandemic, like people swapping things out. I just, yeah, it's been, it's amazing. And I love, Mm. you know, I love that Instagram has created this community that, you know, you can see, you know, in some ways it's very gratifying, you know, you do see the fruits of your labor, like you said, but also it's like empowering people who never really felt like they, you know, could share these things, like they can share with their friends and, you know, with the author. And I think it's pretty special. I know when I, when I was growing up, like the cookbooks that I was reading, you know, the idea of to to be able to write a cookbook, you kind of had to be like a professional chef or, um, you know, I mean, the cookbooks I was reading was like Stephanie Alexander and Jamie Oliver and, you know, they were like famous essentially. And I think it's kind of leveled the playing field a lot. I think people with a story to tell or something to share can have a platform and it's free and, yeah, it's so nice being able to interact, you know, with people 
cooking and at the you know we're all the same <laughs> when we're cooking you know it kind of really levels the playing field I think yeah how I'm curious to know what that experience has been like for you because in BB's Kitchen is such a storytelling book as well as a recipe book um what what is your kind of feedback that you're getting from people who are cooking the recipes but also digging into the stories of the BBs and their food um, so when this book was going out originally to like in the know people or like people in food, I written this letter to everybody just saying, um, like to hundred people, I think it was, but I wrote a letter basically saying that I hope you adopt these recipes as your own. And I hope that this book reveals some part of yourself to you. Right. Because every bit of the book was really curated with the audience that we wanted to take this book home, right? Like the Indian Ocean, the naming the book BBs, which is grandmother, but an easy word that people can say, you know, each recipe having like less than 10 ingredients in it. Like all those, all those things were done with who we knew was going to read an African recipe for the first time, an African recipe. Like, I don't even know what that is, but you know, when people think about African cuisine, they think about just like, they don't think about 54 countries. They think about like Africa, a country and not a continent. So like demystifying that for me was the way that I came into this book, the perspective I came into this book at, but to watch people actually take it, adopt the recipes for themselves, see themselves in the book, share with me stories of their, you know, their grandmother doing um a season in Madagascar or their parents and having parents having a honeymoon in Tanzania or you know the way that the pilaf rice is made um or the pilaf style rice that is made in our in our book is similar to their aunt in Pakistan it just is it's done for me I guess something that I've always known which is the world is so small and we're so much more alike than we're not and I don't know. It's it's left me feeling so hopeless of what's possible, you know, um, and what's to come for all of us in cooking. When I when I think about cooking, like I I love Instagram and I I love watching people make food. And you know, sometimes people be like, "Oh, this was poorly plated," and I'm like, "I'm reposting that <laughs> because I'm not. It's not the it's not the perfection of the the recipe I'm into. It's like, was it good? Did it introduce you to something new? You know." Um, How will you make it different next time? How did you improvise? Did your pantry expand more because of this recipe? Like, those are the things I'm interested in. And I really want to get away from the idea that things have to be perfect, which is kind of the world we've been living in until this year, which, you know, maybe some things, some, some good things have come out of 2020. But for me, one of them has to be that, like, we're all a bit of a mess and we're just trying to figure it out as we go. And, you know, I... I love the realness of 2020. I do. Yeah. That was something that I really loved about like food media this year was everyone was at home and the, the, it stopped being a set or like a really beautiful location that food content was being filmed in. It was in a poorly lit kitchen or, you know, (laughs) with a kid running through or a cat jumping (laughs) on the counter. Like it was, it was, the real it was reality yeah yeah and and also like the people we want to be buying our books right and engaging with like i i do want to be talking to grandmothers i do want to be talking to people who are between the age of 25 and 32 who are not traveling as much anymore but using food as a gateway into other cultures and covid really brought me closer to that cuz you you got to see these people asking for a book as a gift or whatever. And then they're like, this was my first time using Daytar. I'm like, wow. You mm. know, where before it was like, like you said, it was a set. Mm. This is kind of related to something um, you said before Easter of, you know, people's perception or the kind of, you know, a joke maybe that they make about the Otolenghi world of you know oh I have to buy extra different ingredients or I have to you know go out of my way to find something as if that is a bad thing or you know some kind of um uh I don't know as if as if trying something new is is inconvenient um 
and I've been thinking a lot in preparation for this talk about the idea of like the weeknight meal and what that idea of like, you know, convenience at the, you know, over everything else, convenience over trying something new, convenience over spending 10 more minutes doing something or preparing something in advance. Um, and obviously convenience has its place, but I'm curious to know if, if in developing recipes or cooking for yourselves this year, the idea that you're not rushing around trying to make 10 meetings a day or, um, you know, you're in the car all day or whatever your life looked like before. Um, what the idea of like convenience in relation to cooking, how that, how that idea has changed and what the idea of like a weeknight meal could be now. It's a hard one for me to answer because, uh, cause I feel for the last few months, things have been pretty normal for me in the sense that we've been going to work every day. So I've just been developing recipes as usual, but, um, yeah, convenience. Uh, for me, it's about cooking with things like beans and grains and making sure that you're using up things in your cupboard, like I said before, and cooking with things that have lots of different uses. Like, again, like I talked about tin fish and um, the oil that sits behind it and using that again and keeping things back that you, you know, teaching people about keeping things back like Parmesan rinds and and going back to the long, like the Ottolenghi long ingredient lists, there are lots of new ingredients. And um, like I said before that, um, that, I mean, that I kind of get annoyed if people say, oh, it's too long. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to go and get all those ingredients, but really you, there are so many ways that you can substitute. Um, and I always say like my, my messages, my Instagram is always open. If you have any questions about, how things can be substituted. Um, but I think when we create recipes, we always try to make sure that we're using ingredients that, you know, that can be used many times over. Like we're not going to ask you to go and get um, za'atar, for example, if if we can't show you other ways to use it or can't sort of defend the use of it in, in lots of other contexts. Um, so yeah, we're not going to just like tell you to go and get caviar for one dish or something. Not that we ever put caviar in, <laughs> in any recipe. I don't know why I said that, but you know, uh, all these spices and um, all these ingredients um, that might look or seem different will have lots of other uses and will propel you into using your in imagination to create new things as well. Mm -hmm. Julia, that idea of yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you go. I was just going to say like. Um, yeah, the idea of like new ingredients and and different ingredients and things. Like I I mean my recipes are like notoriously sim simple, I suppose, and have like quite store cupboard ingredients. But in saying that as well, um, I think when we do put interesting interesting ingredients, like it's it's like what perspective are we coming from? Like I find um, you know, za'atar, for example, is like such a used ingredient in so many cultures in Melbourne, you know, mm -hmm. it's definitely from like this kind of main, mainstream white perspective that we're like, you know, feeling like we have to justify it and we should, you know, we should be embracing um, or just like, you know, I think, you know, we should be using it without any apologies because I think, you know, it's mm -hmm. so commonplace to so many people and, when if we are feeling like yeah we have to um I don't know I don't know if I'm saying it right but um <laughs> yeah I no just, I understand I, what I you think, mean the idea yeah. of of like this is a this is a new ingredient for or who different like who or, is who yeah, is the for audience for, yeah. the, for a recipe exactly yeah. exactly and so I think even I was thinking a lot about my new book and um you know I used a lot of there's a lot of Japanese recipes in there because you know my partner's Japanese and we cook um, a lot of Japanese food at home and I you know in the introduction I like kind of clarified and um, gave um, you know explanations of the ingredients and part of me wish I hadn't because I feel like it's 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 um, I guess catering to one specific audience and assuming that people don't know what it is and I kind of wish that I hadn't had done that um, because I think people will find it out themselves anyway. Like, you know, once upon a time, um, you know, olive oil in Australia was sold only in like pharmacies, you know, you know, you couldn't, 
and it was only until you know the Italian migrants came here that you could buy olive oil in delis and shops like everything was new once or like brought to a country or what have you and I think people are very capable now especially of discovering it and doing their own kind of yeah discovery and finding new shops and yeah so my next book I don't think I'll do like a glossary (laughs) anyway (laughs) (laughs) um that kind of reminds me of like that anecdote about olive oil reminds me a little of um you know in recent years the 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 turmeric conversation of you know health food I assume white health wellness influences or cooks discovering turmeric as this kind of like new miracle golden latte kind of thing and it and it's brought up some really necessary conversations um in previous years that and as as well this year um that have been kind of amplified about like who who gets to be the bearer of ingredients or food or or ingredients like histories um yeah, I would love to have a little chat about that if if that's kind of like sparking anything for any of you. I'll just say this because lately a lot of people have been asking me because of this book that people are deeming African and et cetera, et cetera. But I, my take is, is that you get to cook with whatever ingredients you want, but you have to pay homage to where it comes from. You have to educate your audience about it. You have to give credit. And ultimately you have to say that you don't own it, right? So in America, there's a lot of like Indian companies that are not owned by Indian people, you know, chai consumer packaged goods companies that are owned by just like a random person. But the intention and the branding behind it is that it's owned by an Indian person, right? And so it then disfranchises a whole entire community. It's someone who went to go do yoga for two weeks in, you know, in I don't know, Kolkata, and then they come back inspired, but instead of giving credit to where it comes from, they kind of take ownership of it. Um, so even with recipes, if you're if you're making a stew that is curry stewed, you have to say that this is a curry stew. Here's where I got my inspiration from. <laughs> Every mm. everyone's laughing. <laughs> but you have to, right? You do, you do. I I I I feel like people are you know, people are now like afraid to make different things and no one should be afraid to cook. You shouldn't be afraid Mm. to cook. What we want you to do is give, pay homage to where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Educate your audience about it. Encourage them to call it by its right name. Don't water Mm -hmm. it down, own it, and Mm -hmm. then erase people from the narrative. Right? That's my take on it. For sure. I agree. Yeah, it's, and I it's, think, a, it's an yeah. urging to not treat food as if it exists in a vacuum and it came from nowhere, that it has a history just like people do. And I think that uh, idea of, like um, you said, just, Easter I guess of, following oh, on sorry. from that. Oh, sorry. oh, no, no, no. Go for it. <laughs> I was just going to say what you said, Easter, <laughs> about, <laughs> you know, shopping for different ingredients. I think often you have to go to tiny, you know, you can't buy them at the mega, you know, we have like two big supermarkets here and you can't find like Rose Harissa there. And it encourages people to go and shop at these places which are owned by people from that culture. And I think that nothing bad can come from that, you know, and I think if you're pushing people to do that, like that's so incredible. Anyway, sorry. I 100% agree. <laughs> 100% agree. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say, I, I guess I feel very lucky to have been working with um, Yatam Atalengi for, for five years because one of the first things he taught us um, is to always pay, uh, like, um, pay credit, to always um, talk about your influence, to talk about how every dish is, um, to talk about what has inspired that dish, whether that's a person or a restaurant, um, and to, to talk about the ingredients um, and that's just something that he taught us from the beginning and that I've always done in my recipe writing in the last four and a half years just as a standard because I didn't know any other way. Um, so I'm mm. I'm so great. I mean, hopefully that would have come naturally anyway, but um, he's he was an incredible teacher in that. Um, and there's actually quite a few recipes in, in flavor, for example, where people don't really understand why we've called a recipe a certain title. Like, for example, there's a cucumber salad in 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 flavor called and we've called it cucumber salad a la shan impression going back to that 
restaurant that I'm mm-hmm. obsessed with, this Sichuan restaurant. And our cu- the cucumber salad in flavor is, is nothing like theirs. Um, I mean, it's it's got cucumbers and a sesame sauce, but the point of the reason why we called it that and why the whole of the introduction is about this restaurant is because like, had we not eaten that salad in that restaurant um, and th- then sort of research that that classic combination that we didn't know about of of cucumber and sesame paste in in Sichuan cooking we would have never have come up with that dish um Mm. so I mean that's just a a small example but yeah I think I think what Hawa said is totally spot on don't don't I don't think we should be scared of of cooking things I think the world would be a very boring place if we could only cook um uh, or use ingredients from our own culture um, but absolutely pay respect where it's due, um, acknowledge the inspiration. And that's also really important because, you know, if you say what dish something is inspired that by, then people can go back and uh, read up about that dish, read up about those ingredients, read up about that person or that cuisine. Um, and even if you're doing a twist on a classic, you know, be open about the fact that this this is a twist on a classic, but please go and read about that. and about that classic and maybe cook it and yeah learn more Mm, mm. um when you are when you're you know you use the example of going to a restaurant being really inspired and coming up with something new um can you think of like a an example this year or in in kind of recent years where there's been like a food memory from your childhood or a you know a dining experience where you're you know, you're on holiday and you stumble into somewhere and you forget the name and you forget what the, the, you know, dish was called, but there's that very specific kind of taste memory that you have that you go on to try to recreate. I would love to hear um, what some of those are for, for all three of you. I'll um, start. <laughs> no, go on. Yeah. <laughs> you can go on. You, would you... No, 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 no. Um, I've just spoken. Grew- I'm getting bored of my voice. <laughs> Um, I grew, I grew up in Seattle and in the nineties, when I came, Seattle had an influx of immigrants from Asia. And so there were a ton of Cambodians and ton of Vietnamese, and there were some Russians and then the rest was, were Somalis and Ethiopians. And so I've always had this love for like Vietnamese food and Cambodian food and even Filipino food. But there's something that's happened this year in the way that I crave broth from pho, which like I used to travel. It was like a a food memory associated with Seattle. So I'm like, oh, I'll go to Seattle and I'll have pho when I land. But because I couldn't go home at all this year, it was one thing I was creating often. Like I cooked a lot of broth for me or I craved broth. So I ordered broth. Which another reason why I've fallen in love with this this Vietnamese sandwich is because a lot of the flavorings <laughs> of it remind me of just home. It reminds me of elementary school, people bringing dishes for like cultural day and like us splitting our food. My best friend growing up was a boy named Koi who had just come from Vietnam when I was coming from Somalia, and so I've spent my whole COVID really ordering in, but it's been food that has been comforting and has reminded me of just the way that I grew up, which was flavors of some Asian countries. Mm. Mm. Nice. I've been trying to recreate like this red sauce that my grandma used to make. (laughs) Um, And it's so, I haven't got it yet because I, I just can't get the flavor right. Like I think, I don't know if I ever will. And I think I just have to probably make it my own now. Um, But it's, you know, you put, um, it's so basic, you know, you kind of fry some onions um, in a lot of olive oil and then it's just various small amounts of meat. So, you know, it might be like one kind of like rib of pork, some sausages and some like stewing beef. Um, And then it's just heaps of um yeah, tomato, tomato passata, and it just cooks for hours and hours. And I made that a lot during lockdown um, with kind of like the hand, hand rolled pasta. Um, mm. Yeah, that is totally my childhood. And I really missed, I think because I, yeah, I couldn't see my mom and we couldn't have family around. And I think especially 
you know, having a baby during this year, like I just really craved those like nurturing kind of foods that made me feel really cocooned and comforted, which usually my mum would come over and kind of make big pots of sauce and, um, yeah, things like that. That's that's a one thing that really I've been trying to like make a lot of this lockdown. Mm-hmm. Easter, what about you? Uh, well, I kind of feel bad following on from that because what I was cooking a lot was was really for my mother because I feel bad for saying before that it was uh, difficult to be with her during no. lockdown, but I guess it was also a blessing. <laughs> um, no. fun, but, uh, <laughs> I also don't wish that I was like with my mom during lockdown. Yeah, like, I think we're all like, no, yeah. no, okay, no, so. <laughs> but, yeah, okay, so. <laughs> The grass is always greener. Um, it was pretty <laughs> hectic and difficult. I'd say ninety percent of the time, we we get on really well, but we had a lot of fights. But I did I did want to make her happy through some difficult times. And for my mum, happiness comes in the form of a plantain. And so my mum's Brazilian, but grew up in Cuba before going back to Brazil. Mm. So everywhere where she grew up, there was plantain with, with every meal. And um, yeah. For me, it's just really simple. Just I like to cook it with oil and ghee um, and spices and lime and sometimes a scotch bonnet or a habanero. And we we kind of had that with every meal during lockdown. Um, but for me, that's, mm. that's, that's the most comforting thing. It's what I grew up eating. And that and black beans, it doesn't get more comforting than that. And that's pretty much... I think we had that at least two or three times a week during the first lockdown. Mm. Yeah, yeah, delicious. What's scotch bonnet? That's, um, <laughs> we we said the same thing. <laughs> oh, that reminds what, me. What? I remember watching a what video I, of you. Um, oh, sorry. No, you go. I'm just wondering what's what's scotch bonnet. Oh, scotch bonnet. It's like a well. It's the best chili in the world. I don't. I guess I don't know ah. what you would call it there, but um, it's a, it's a Caribbean chili from bonnet. the West Indies. Okay. Uh, but it's it's cool. really similar in taste to to habanero. Um, okay. But habaneros are generally like dry, and Scotch bonnets are like yeah, right. Generally fresh, and they're yeah, yeah like a Caribbean chili, and they're really hot oh. and really sort of fruity and smoky. And I mm. I think they're the most incredible thing. I wow. I think they're probably I've my never seen ingredient. I've never seen a- them yet. Yeah. Mm. Oh, no, no, you have. They're pretty popular, and really, also just if you. Yeah, if you Google like Caribbean uh, pepper, it's that's it, and it's similar to West African peppers. Oh. So it's probably just under a different cool. name, Sorry, maybe Julia. Yeah, yeah maybe a different it. name. Yeah, yeah. You have it under a different. Do you call I'm it sure Scotch bonnet? Under a different in, name, yeah. Scotch bonnets, like it's like okay. of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm the chilies are really the key it. because when you, mm-hmm. how are you talking about pho just reminded me about 10 years ago, I was in New York and I was craving pho and no matter where I went, any Vietnamese place I went, they didn't have, because in, here in Australia, we're so close to Southeast Asia, we get, you know, Thai bird's eye chilies and the, the mm-hmm. spiciest, tiniest red chilies that, um, I don't know, maybe it's different now, but 10 years ago, the pho was served with like very mild jalapenos. And I was like, this is just not it. This is not what a bowl of pho is to me. And I couldn't get over not having that like, you know, eye watering kind of chili. I have to tell you yesterday, I, I've been on a juice cleanse for like five days, but I had yesterday off. I had Sunday and yet I had today off as well, but um, <laughs> I ordered a, I ordered a pokey bowl like from a Hawaiian restaurant and I added a uh, Thai bird uh, chili peppers. This was uh, on it. And then this was me. I was like picking them out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing with, when you, when you have them with the fur, like I like a little bit, but if you put too many in, like the whole broth is like fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't yeah, eat them. It's like you don't have to eat them and it's hot enough. Totally. Yeah. I had a, I had like a, a wake up call yesterday. I was like, you don't want to eat these. You've been, I know you added them, but you've been on a cleanse. You need to. Yeah. So. Your poor stomach. I also feel like yeah. we need to go like rewind an hour, scrap that entire conversation and now talk about your like going on a juice cleanse for a week. That's intense. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
No. no. I mean, we're, <laughs> also, no, we're doing nothing. <laughs> How is it going? How are you dealing with like, not? I, I tried to do like a smoothie kind of thing once and not, someone told me that the act of chewing is like, ignites like your, um, the like, happiness receptors in your brain and so not chewing could like make you feel really depressed (laughs) (laughs) I mean I don't so I did it for five days I could never have gotten through five days without not being at home and my partner was like what is so different this time because there have been many times in my life I try to I've, I've tried attempting this and I think it has something to do with being at home and like drinking water and using the restroom as you want and not, you know, not being stressed about being on the subway, running around, being at a meeting, going to a restaurant. Uh Like I had no temptations. I was just at home. Mm. It was, it was honestly nice. I woke up every day clear headed. I woke up thankful. I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to go back on it after Thanksgiving. (laughs) Wow. What are you cooking for Thanksgiving? Oh yeah, great question. I'm not. I'm Are you not? not. <laughs> I was I was just on a panel called A Different Thanksgiving and they were like, Your Thanksgiving must be so much multicultural. What are you doing? And I was like Nothing. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> and and on a <laughs> And honestly, I, I do, I traditionally, I do enjoy Thanksgiving. I do, it, it is, it's a big part of how I got to be in like a very healthy American experience in this country was going to my friends' homes and eating with their family, not just on Thanksgiving, but mm-hmm. always. And so for me, it represents, it has a lot of happy memories attached to it, but it's just a different type of year. It's also one where there's like a lot of reconciling going, you know, happening in America. And I'm just, my friend and her husband are maybe cooking and I said, I'll, you know, I'll come and I'll hang and that's it. (laughs) We can give thanks. We can give thanks every day. Every day of the juice right? cleanse. Exactly. <laughs> without, without like marshmallow topped like sweet potato pie. I feel like just talking through it, I've come around on the idea of a juice cleanse as well because after this year, <laughs> the idea every day of going, what am I going to make for lunch? What am I going to make for dinner? And then doing the dishes afterwards. Like that has just been the oh. constant daily churn of like I've run it. I've, I've now gone back to the – the meals I cooked at the start of lockdown that I started putting on my Instagram story being like, what did I make eight months ago? Maybe I could just do that again. I've run out of ideas. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, um, I was, what was I going to say about the, Oh, the dishes. I haven't had any dishes, but one of the reasons why I have fallen out of love with cooking for myself is because we've been cooking on Instagram Mm. that has been exhausting Mm. yeah you know the need to share the need to be a professional the need to come alive on these channels and then Mm -hmm. people have been asking you know depending on who it is you're partnering with they're asking you to make something you you don't even get to decide Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i i am more than okay not cooking (laughs) <laughs> that is actually something I, 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 I noted down because at the, at the start of, at the start of lockdown, I feel like food advice and instruction became this like mm. very sought after thing, you know, everyone wanted to like zoom into cooks kitchens and, and find out what they were doing. And I have to imagine there were days when you just wanted to like sit in bed and eat ice cream or make leftovers oh, or yeah. do something really comforting and nourishing mm. um but mm. but that um the counterpoint it's like well I can promote my book or I can you know everyone needs food right now and there's a need for me um it's just, sorry yeah, I, I feel f- like I talked over you oh, just sorry. then but no no I was just gonna I, I just really resonated with what how I was saying and I find myself becoming disconnected with cooking as well because I hardly ever just cook to cook uh, even if I'm just cooking for myself or my partner, there's, I think, oh, I better take a photo of that. I better post it or something, which is ridiculous. And also, I mean, I mean, I didn't think about this when you asked the question before, but I think one of the hardest parts, I mean, personally, obviously, there was a hell of a lot more going on in the world. But one of the hardest parts of lockdown for me was the need, well, that we had to 
put out these recipe videos all the time and it's incredibly time consuming and hard and like it looks like you're just like ah, laughing mm. around in the garden cooking up mm. a sauteed whatever it is but actually <laughs> it involves like hours of like filming it and then filming it again and then trying to work out how the hell you edit I mean I don't know how to use a phone let alone a computer I you know and then <laughs> having to like crop it and whatever and then mm -hmm. do it again because you lost it and and it just all ends up taking hours if not days and then you post it and then you you look all happy and it's just like oh god <laughs> but anyway so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think I said it before, but yeah, Instagram is a really mixed bag. It's a great thing, but it's also it's also a curse. <laughs> mm. Mm. How do we yeah, how do we get to a place? I don't I don't know how, but how do we get to a place where um we're honest about that process and we talk mm. about how exhausting it is to mm. make this perfect thing, you know? And and mind you, if there are other people who depend on you to send the photos, to send the video, to wear the clothes that were sent to you or to do the partnership, that even, you know, that consumes like 20 mm. hours of your week. Mm, and so we yeah. go from pretending that we've got this beautiful, kind, loving job where we educate people. And then, you know, you just spend 20 hours or so just doing one bean dish for Instagram. <laughs> like I, 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 I'm on it. I'm being honest. Like, I, I don't know when the happy medium comes about where we have, mm. maybe we should do an Instagram live, the four of us. And we just have this conversation and. Yeah. I would love people. that. <laughs> Can we do a four way That's Instagram exhausting. live? Is that. <laughs> we'll film oh, it and then edit it. And put it, it in <laughs> <laughs> but I, <laughs> But it's true. Like, I think the the burnout this year, like the first lockdown when I feel like it was all about video, you know, that first part where like every, like every, like Tom, Dick and Harry wanted a video. It didn't matter if they were a food focused, like brand or like I was doing stuff for like clothing brands and it's like everyone just wanted a piece of food, which, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to complain as well because it's like there are people with no jobs and I felt really grateful that I could just like be working from home and still like doing stuff. But it is a lot. Like I remember I, I did one job and I got sent all the like gear and I had to like, my husband was like on the B-roll camera and I was like, oh my God, this is so hard. <laughs> like it was really hard. <laughs> and I just like love writing books so much. Like if I could just like be on my, like in my little corner right yeah books like I'd be really happy but you know um and I think for me personally this year having a, a baby like at the beginning of all of this and trying to juggle that kind of like outward um image I suppose of like having my shit together and meanwhile I've got like a 10 week old baby and a five-year-old who like kinder had shut down I was just like oh my God. <laughs> losing yeah. it a little bit <laughs> We need to start yeah. like a Wild. children's video editing class for Laura so that he can. He and can, then I, I was like, the only you know. way I can do these videos is if he's in them with me because, like, otherwise he'll be screaming in the background. So I was like, you're going to record them with me, Harry. And anyway, he became I'm a laughing. Star. I'm laughing, but I, I probably cry. Yeah. I'm crying on the yeah. inside. Yeah. How are you? So, what you said before just like it made me think the. I feel like you can always pick someone who has never had to edit a video in their life and it's the person who comments, you should make a YouTube channel on an Instagram <laughs> post. Oh, yeah. Because it's like you you should give this a go because. <laughs> oh. We, my, my partner and I laugh a lot because um, I call him about everything. I'm like, the the sound on my Zoom isn't working. What do I do? He's like, <laughs> did you go to preference on your thing? Did you check there to see that it wasn't on mute? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, but I, I laugh because, you know, people think that if you were at the test kitchen at Bon Appetit, you must know how to do videos. And you're like, do you know that is magic? That is like 10 other people recording me cutting out that I said I didn't know what the temperature of such and such was that I you know <laughs> that 
uh, that my pasta is soggy. Like, (laughs) but again, it goes back to this whole idea of perfection. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where it's come from, but people live by it. People are, they're tied down to it. I was just telling a friend, um, one of the things I really do love about 2020 is that this idea that we all are getting closer to our real selves, you know, that I, that we don't have to be, you know, we're not watching celebrities go on another private jet to go to some other Island. We're not watching our coworkers do a hundred and million things because it's business as usual. And so mm-hmm. I hope that even with food, we get more, into the process of, let me show you how many times I messed up this dish. It's Mm -hmm. odd to write a a book based on cuisine people are not familiar with. And you're reading some of these things on Facebook and you're like, well, (laughs) you didn't burn your hawaj. You didn't, you couldn't (laughs) have burned your spices. It'll just taste more, you know, it'll, it'll taste more potent in your food, but you didn't burn it. And, and people are like, I couldn't get it right. I did it wrong. This Mm. recipe is wrong. And you're like, (laughs) is it really wrong? Or did you want it to come out? However, in your mind, you thought it was supposed to come out. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I don't know. You know, it's like, it's like, how do we teach people that? And, and I'm really interested in this. I'm like, there are 10 to 20 different ways in which I could show you how to use Zaytar. There are mm-hmm. a million ways I could show you how to make a combination of zaytar, of hawaj, of barbare. I can do that for you, but I can't teach you how to appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And the appreciation has to come from you going away from this idea that things need to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. like the undoing of the things that we've learned from Instagram, that these photos need to be bright and beautiful and the plating needs to be right. I've been in food for the last five. I don't even know how to plate. I'm like, I'm making it up <laughs> as I go too. Mm-hmm. Totally. Mm-hmm. So I, I I want us to all lean into that and then like push <laughs> that on our other friends. <laughs> <laughs> like a video of messing up, like really messing up. <laughs> yes. I like well, that. Well, also because the there's the idea that you can only share once you're an expert or once you've really nailed mm. something or, you know, mm. the, I the love amateur doesn't one. get the same kind of yeah. airtime or attention. Mm. I love seeing all of, like yeah. I love seeing everybody's food that they're cooking and it's, you know, it doesn't look, like the one in the book but even when I cook it it's not going to look like the food in my book (laughs) you know that was in a studio and like I think yeah Yeah. I think talking about it really breaks down that idea of you know that's how it's going to look on your table like you know most Mm. of the time at dinner I'm like juggling kids and you know cooking something in 10 minutes and like even if I take a photo of it it's not going to look you know it's not perfect at all and I hope I hope people feel especially this year that yeah it doesn't have to be perfect number one to share but also like that it's not somehow good enough you know like I for Mm -hmm. me Mm -hmm. writing this new book was all about feeding your family and feeding your friends and um you know that food is it is like it's at the bottom line it's you know it's feeding and it's sharing and it doesn't have to be this kind of like perfect um yeah, I just, I hate that whole perfect, mm. like mm. perfectly styled, perfect. It's just like yeah. not who I am as anyway. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I made the first time I, know, I made your... Also... Oh. <laughs> Easter, you go. <laughs> no, it was just, uh, just a really quick one. I was going to say, and, and let's hope our, our audiences are also receptive to that. I remember I, I, I posted a pasta dish last Sunday or something. And most people really liked it, but I remember seeing this one comment from this woman who said, your sauce looks split and you haven't done this right. And then she ended up saying, I'm sure you can do better than that. I'm like, it was pretty good. I don't think I can. Like, uh, Anyway, sorry. Side note. The, uh, I feel like we could do a whole nother hour on the uh, reviews of a recipe. And also, you know, reviews in general Wait, are another thing. I, uh, <laughs> I have I've I have a, a very yeah, go. very Oh no, go ahead. No, 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 go, go, go. You've both got one. I, I feel very... like we need to hear both of these. <laughs> I have a very funny one. So, <laughs> I joined a book club that is cooking from the book. I don't know why. 
but it's you know like I'm I'm actually in business. I, I'm in consumer packaged goods, and so a lot of the work that I do is like research of what does the what does the the group that we're trying to reach want, right? Like it's market studies. And so I was doing it kind of for my condiment line, but also for my ego, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I logged into this thing and this woman was, she played it, this book to a T, like better than us. It was beautiful. It was like, it almost looked like French cooking. I was like, this is not what we're going for, but this is so, this is so pretty. <laughs> but in every plating thing that she did, she gave it a nice review. And then on other people's comments, she wrote, not my favorite book, but <laughs> so because it's Facebook, I wrote her and I said, hi, I'm Hala. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to see you here. You know, I see that you've cooked a lot from the book and your your plating is so impeccable. Can I ask you what you didn't like about the book? And she comes back and she goes, oh, my God, you're writing me. And then she goes <laughs> into saying, you know, I'm Indian. I live in this part of India. I'm a doctor. I use cooking as a as like kind of a stress reliever. These recipes I'm very familiar with. And I, I wanted to so desperately write her back and say that is the actual point. But I just said to her, I said, thank you so much for your feedback. Like, really looking forward to growing together and seeing you at the next cookbook. But I was like, that's the whole point. Making the world closer, <laughs> using the Indian Ocean, mm. talking about African cooking. But her main issue was that I didn't use banana leaves in some of the recipes, that it felt very tailored to a Western audience and a lot of the flavors that she understood really well because she grew up on the ocean. Mm. Mm. It's like you're not the audience yeah. for this book, man. Yeah. And I I found <laughs> very like, subjective. I, yeah. This year I came <laughs> to like this realization that, you know, you, if people don't like your book or your recipes, it has to do with them and not with you. I found this out <laughs> through my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, you know, I was like really freaking out about releasing my next book. Like I, you know, my first book was received so well here in Melbourne, especially. And I was like, oh my God, it's going to be the sequel, like the dreaded sequel that like it flops. And I was really panicking about it. And I think I, yeah, I was speaking to my therapist and she's like, if people don't respond to it, it's got to do with them and how, what they're, you know, bringing themselves, like how they're bringing themselves to your book rather than what you've put out there. Like you've put out something with great intention, with integrity, um, you know, something that is pleasing to you. And if people don't love it or like someone doesn't like this recipe, it's, you know, that's fine. But it has to do with like what they're bringing to it and how they're responding. That was like my mm. light bulb moment this year. <laughs> mm. Mm. It's an important I aha moment to get to. Easter, did you have a uh, a review anecdote that we could? We, we're going to have to end in a minute, so I feel like this might be our oh. our, our closing oh, anecdote. I don't think it's good enough to end on. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it's really quick, so let's end on something else. But I'll tell you quickly. It was just uh, one of the first reviews when the book was released in the US, and it uh, and literally hadn't they didn't have any reviews except for this one. And the the title of the review was "Too Much Coconut." Um, and then the review said, I do not like using so much coconut, one star. Um, and then I was like, okay. So, so the whole rating of the book was one star because it was the first review. I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then I was like, but hang on a second. There's only three coconut recipes in the book. And then I started flipping through the book and then I was like, oh no, that, that recipe has got coconut in it. That recipe has got coconut in it. And I realized that there was actually like a good, like 20, 20 or so recipes that had coconut and I was like okay fair enough you don't like coconut this is not the book for you <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean, that was pretty fun <laughs> um I feel like I had a I have never written a cookbook but I have written a, a book about myself so the reviews are always very uh you know my my publisher and publicist used to yell at me if I happened to read my Goodreads reviews which i did in like my, you know, when I just wanted to, a bit of self punishment, but um, it would be you know people people like you said Julia they bring themselves to it and they go 
this is what I expect. Mm. This is what I want, mm. specifically me and my experience. And if this does not cater specifically to me and meet these needs that I'm taking into this this book, then it has failed in its mission. Yeah. Because I think yeah. when you're writing a, a book, like you're writing it for an audience, but I I strongly believe like when I write a book, it's for myself as well. Like it's my mm. life's work and it's my passion and my <clears throat> what sparks joy for me. So, <laughs> you know, it has yeah. to be satisfying to myself first and foremost and then mm. I can only just hope that people will enjoy it as well. That's like my only hope is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. I feel like we might end on, I would love to end on hearing from each of you who you are turning to for your your food media, your recipes, your inspiration, whether it's on Instagram or in real life. Where are you going for the, the things you want to cook or write about next? Ooh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, what are we doing? Um, uh, for me, like my I'll, my great I'll... obsession is is Mexican. F- oh, sorry. No, great obsession is Mexican. Okay, so well, yeah, my 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 greatest obsession is is Mexican food and um and especially sort of modern Mexican food, but but using the techniques and the culture of um, classic Mexican cuisine. So someone that I follow a lot and that I'm kind of low-key obsessed with is um, Daniela Soto Ines, who um, is is based in New York, although I think she moved, but um, she obviously has an incredible career. And I think she was the first, um, the first woman to, no, the youngest woman to be named best female chef. Not that these things should matter, but I, I don't know. She's crazy cool and I love her food and her work and her writing and yeah. Um, I've been turning to a lot of the women in my life. Um, I've been asking an auntie of mine who helped to raise me in Seattle, who's from Shreveport, Louisiana. So we've been talking a lot about the connections of the Atlantic Ocean to West African cooking and what that looks like. So you know, exploring with collard greens and things like that. Um, I don't, I can't think of anybody I've been following online more than Yawande, who has a cookbook coming out um, on Nigerian cuisine, who I adore. Um, she's talking about basically what it means to be from a place like Legos every single day. And her book is reflective of that. And so Yawande and I FaceTime almost every single day to encourage each other on how to like recreate oh. foods from home. So good. That, her, her tofu coconut dish from the New York times with the blistered snap peas. That has been Yum. my most, my most cooked recipe during lockdown. It is it's everything. Wow. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Julia, how about um, you? What have I, I've been, I think this year I realized how much I don't know about Maltese cooking, which kind of pains me because, you know, it's totally my roots and something that I love to eat. But um, I've been, yeah, trying to cook a lot more Maltese food this year. So I've been talking to my mum a lot about, you know, the kind of foods she grew up with and my dad as well. And speaking to my auntie in Malta to try and get those secrets. I feel like everyone's getting so much older and trying to like capture, you know, there's not really many or any Maltese cookbooks in English. So yeah, trying to um, capture those recipes, like, you know, I don't want to say before it's too late, but, you know, I really do want to kind of have them written down so I've been trying to I've been making a lot of um like ravioli which is essentially like a ravioli um and these like Maltese baked potatoes with lamb like it's you know there are so many threads with Greece and Malta and Sicily but yeah just trying to capture those and um yeah also been doing a lot of preserving like we've we made miso paste um like a few weeks ago so just reading a lot of um Japanese preserving books as well Mm. yeah a lot of older books though I don't tend to like I don't know I love Instagram and stuff but I always go to like the kind of older cookbooks and things Mm. like that for my Mm. inspiration I suppose yeah yeah 
Well, thank you all so much. This was such a great chat, such a nice way to start the day um, for for Julia and I, at least. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone, for watching. If you don't have them yet, you can pick up copies of Ottolenghi Flavor in BB's Kitchen and A Year of Simple Family Food from your local independent bookstore. Um, mine happens to be Neighborhood Books, which is also coincidentally the official online bookseller for this event. So um, if you live near me, you can walk down the street and grab a coffee or mm-hmm. you can pop over to their website and add the books to your cart there. Um, great Christmas gifts, I've got to say. Um, uh <laughs> Thank you, Easter, Hawa, and Julia for um for this chat today. I feel like we need to now go and have our Instagram live about the pressures of making online content. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to see you all. Visit wheelercenter.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.